What is going on everyone? Welcome back to another video. This is going to be part two of the Fluent tutorial for a converging diverging nozzle. In the first video, we looked at the flow through a converging diverging nozzle, more specifically for the subsonic choke flow condition, where we had subsonic flow entering our converging diverging nozzle. As the flow progressed through the converging part of the nozzle, the flow would accelerate and we would see a decrease in pressure, but since it did not reach Mach 1 or sonic flow at the throat of the nozzle, the flow decreased in velocity and the pressure of the flow increased as it moved through the diverging part of the nozzle until the exit pressure. However, in this video, we're going to take a look at the supersonic flow condition where the flow through the converging part of the nozzle is able to reach a Mach number of 1 by the throat or sonic flow. And as a result, the flow will continue to accelerate supersonically through the diverging part of the nozzle and the pressure will continue to decrease until our calculated exit pressure. So as shown before, these are the parameters that I have chosen in order to build my nozzle. And based on these parameters, we're going to take a look at how to find the exit pressure in order to give us this supersonic flow at the exit of our nozzle. So the calculations in order to get the supersonic flow are very, very similar to the ones that we saw for the subsonic flow in part one. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at those calculations and adjust them so that we do get an exit pressure that will give us supersonic flow at the exit of our nozzle instead of subsonic. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. So on screen now are the first part of the calculations that we did in order to find what our subsonic flow conditions were going to be. And these calculations were used in order to find what our critical area was going to be for a converging diverging nozzle based on my chosen value for geometry and inlet conditions. So we started these calculations by finding what the inlet to throat area ratio was going to be based on an inlet Mach number of 0 0.5, which again is a value that it chose. So bringing the inlet Mach number of 0 0.5 into the isentropic flow tables, we found that our area ratio was going to be equal to 1.34. And if we considered that our cross-sectional area of our converging diverging nozzle was to be a rectangle that had a constant width equal to 1 over the length of our nozzle, we saw that our area ratio becomes a ratio of the heights of our nozzle. And therefore, instead of finding the critical area, we found what the critical height of our nozzle was going to be at the throat. And so I took these cross-sectional areas to be rectangular because in Ansys Fluent, I initialized my model to have a 2D planar space. However, keep in mind that if you do decide to choose axisymmetric as your 2D space in Ansys Fluent, you do need to redo the calculations considering that your cross-sectional areas are now going to be circular because this will change the result that you get for the radius of your converging diverging nozzle. So all that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the calculations in order to find what our supersonic flow conditions are going to be. So here we have the calculations that we did in order to find the exit pressure that would give us subsonic flow in the converging diverging nozzle. We can see that our calculation started by finding what the total pressure and total temperature would be inside our nozzle. To do this, we found what our static pressure to total pressure ratio was at a Mach number of 0 0.5. And we also found what our static temperature to total temperature ratio was at a Mach number of 0 0.5. And then based on the chosen values for static pressure and static temperature, we were able to calculate what our total pressure and our total temperature was inside our nozzle. In order to find what our static exit pressure to total pressure ratio was, we found the area ratio between the exit area and the throat area, which gave us a value of 1.555. And then we brought this area ratio into our isentropic flow tables for a subsonic condition to find our pressure ratio to be 0 0.890. However, this is incorrect for supersonic flow because this was found for subsonic flow. So if we were to bring in the same area ratio into our isentropic flow tables, but this time for supersonic flow, we would find our exit static pressure to total exit pressure ratio to be equal to 0 0.149. Knowing that our total pressures at the inlet and outlet for isentropic flow are equal, we could therefore replace our subsonic pressure ratio 
for the newly found supersonic pressure ratio of 0 0.149, which gives us an exit pressure of 39,000. 768.7 pascals. And this is going to be our new exit pressure in order to get supersonic flow at the outlet of our nozzle. Similarly, we can also find what our exit static temperature is going to be. And this is going to be found by finding the static exit temperature to total exit temperature ratio at our area ratio of exit area to throat area, which we found to be equal to 1.555. And plugging this into the isentropic flow tables for supersonic flow, we get our temperature ratio to be equal to 0 0.58. And similarly, like the total pressure, we also know that the total temperature at the inlet and the total temperature at the exit for isentropic flow are equal. Therefore, we can get our exit static temperature to be equal to the temperature ratio that we found of 0 0.58 multiplied by the total temperature that we found here of 307.64 Kelvin, which gives our static exit temperature to be 178.43 Kelvin. And there you have it. These are the 1D calculations in order to get our exit conditions that will give us supersonic flow at the exit of our nozzle. So let's go ahead and jump into ANSYS Workbench in order to start building our simulation. Now that we are in ANSYS Workbench, we can go ahead and start building our simulation. Now, if you haven't seen part one where we did subsonic flow in a converging diverging nozzle, that is okay because I will be going back through the setup of geometry and the mesh. But if you have already seen uh, part one for the subsonic flow, feel free to uh, skip to where we set up the boundary conditions for the flow and actually run the simulation. So all that being said, in order to start setting up the simulation, I'm gonna go ahead and grab my fluid flow fluent analysis system and drag that into my project schematic. And I'm going to double click on geometry to launch space claim. So as we can see in the bottom left, it says starting space claim. So I'll wait for that to load. Now that we are in space claim, we can go ahead and start building the geometry for the simulation. Since this is going to be a CFD simulation, uh, what we're going to be building is the fluid domain of our object. So wherever there's going to be fluid inside of our nozzle. By default, ANSYS has the sketching on the ZX plane. I would, I would rather sketch on the XY plane because it's better for initialization in Fluent. So I'm going to start by clicking on End Sketch Editing, and then I'm going to re-enter sketch mode and select the XY plane, like so. So now to build our geometry, I'm going to go ahead and grab my line command up here. And we're going to start by building the inlet of our nozzle. So I'm going to take a line from the origin and draw it vertically upwards. I'm going to press escape. And then I'm going to come grab my dimensioning tool here and dimension this line to be my inlet measurement of 250 millimeters. There you have it. The next thing we're going to do is grab the line command again, and I'm going to draw the center line of my nozzle. So I'm going to take it from the origin again, but draw it horizontally this time. Press escape and grab my dimensioning tool 
and I'm going to dimension this line to be 850 millimeters, which corresponds to the length of my nozzle. Now, the reason why I call this the center line of my nozzle is because for the simulation, we're only going to be simulating uh, half of the nozzle, and then we're going to mirror the results over the center line in order to reduce the amount of computational power the computer needs in order to run the simulation. So now we can go ahead and build the outlet of our nozzle. I'm going to grab the line command again and go to the other side of the center line. Draw a line vertically upwards again. Press escape and then I'm going to grab my dimensioning tool and dimension this line to be 290 millimeters, like so. Now with our inlet and outlet dimension, I'm gonna go ahead and build the critical area of our nozzle, otherwise known as the throat area. To do this, I'm going to select a point and I'm going to place it inside my grid here. And then I'm gonna come take the dimensioning tool and dimension this point to be 350 millimeters away from my inlet. And I'll measure this point to be 186.5 millimeters away from the center line of our nozzle. Again, representing the width of our critical area or the throat area, the calculations of which I showed at the beginning of this video. And the creation of this point is going to make it easier for us to create the wall of our nozzle by incorporating it into a spline. So to create the wall of my nozzle, I'm going to choose the spline command up here, and I'm going to start it at the inlet of our nozzle. I'm going to choose a point somewhere between the inlet and the throat point. I'm going to then pick the throat point. I'm going to choose a arbitrary point between the throat and the outlet and then I'm going to connect it to the outlet. And then I'm going to press escape to confirm this spline. Now doing the spline this way is going to give a rough approximation of what our wall of the nozzle is going to look like. Now you could get a more accurate representation of your nozzle wall, say if you were to have the equation of the wall or more points along the wall, but since we only have the inlet, the throat, and the outlet, we're limited in how accurate our geometry is going to be to represent our nozzle. But choosing the spline command, and now I can go ahead and if I press escape and click on the spline itself, I could use its trimming points and trim the nozzle to have more of a uniformity in the converging, diverging part of the nozzle. And this is going to give a very good approximation of what our nozzle wall is going to look like for educational purposes. So I'm going to go ahead and continue trimming my spline a little bit until I get a little bit more uniformity in the convergence and divergence part of the nozzle. And I will cut back to you when I'm happy with the result that I have. Hey guys, welcome back. I've gone ahead and trimmed my spline a little bit in order to get a better approximation of what my nozzle wall is going to look like. And one thing to note before we continue is when you are dragging your spline around, your spline is not actually connected to the point that we dimensioned for the throat of our nozzle. This was just to get an approximation of where we want our throat to be. So when you start trimming the points, uh, make sure that you realign the minimum part of our spline to be aligned with the point that we dimensioned here. So with all that being said, this is what our geometry is going to look like. We now have an enclosed shape. So in order to make this a surface, we're going to go ahead and add sketch editing by pressing on the check mark up here. And now with the lines that we've created, we've gone ahead and build a surface, which is representing the fluid inside of our nozzle. So now we can go ahead and move on to the meshing part of this simulation. So I'm going to go ahead and exit space claim by clicking on the big X. And as you can see, we have a check mark beside geometry, so that is good to go. So now we can double click on mesh to launch the mesher. So as you can see down here, it says starting meshing. So I'll wait for that to load. Now with the mesher open, we can go ahead and start creating the mesh for our model. 
So the mesh that I'm going to show you guys today is by far the simplest mesh uh, that you could create. And we're going to verify the orthogonal quality in order to ensure that this is going to be a good mesh moving forward and it's not going to give us any problematic errors that may lead to errors in the calculations and results. Now you should always check the quality of your mesh no matter which mesh you decide to create. This is always a very good uh, practice to do in order to understand uh, where there might be some problematic areas or problematic elements that is hard for the program to calculate and give you a good result. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that after we've created our mesh. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just create the standard mesh from ANSYS. Now by default this is going to be a very coarse mesh so we're going to have to add sizing regardless. And for my sizing all I'm going to do is right click on mesh and then go to insert and press on sizing. Now as you can see down here the yellow boxes are the minimum information that ANSYS needs in order to properly create the sizing. So it needs at least a geometry and the type slash element size uh, that we want. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the face command up here and I'm just going to choose the face of our nozzle, the only face that we have, and I'm going to add this to my geometry. And then for element size, I'm going to, this was by default when we created the, the default mesh from ANSYS, this was the element size that was given to us, which gave us a very coarse mesh. So I'm going to make this a uh, much smaller number by making it 0 0.005. So now as you can see, uh, the sizing has now turned into a face sizing because we've applied it to the face. So now with our sizing in place, we'll go ahead and regenerate the mesh in ANSYS in order to get a more refined mesh. And as you can see on screen, this is the refined mesh that we got from adding the much smaller element sizes in the face sizing. And we've gotten a fairly good result. We can see that a lot of the elements in our model are fairly orthogonal, especially along the nozzle wall and the center line of our nozzle. But we'll go ahead and check the quality to ensure that there's not an area that we need to fix uh, before we move into Fluent. So in order to check the quality of our mesh, we'll press the plus beside the mesh, or beside quality down here. And then for mesh metric, we're going to choose orthogonal quality from the tree, like so. Down here under our model. Now what this graph represents is how orthogonal each of our elements are and how many elements fall within each of these categories. So as we can see down in the bar graph, we can see that the majority of the elements fall within the 99th percentile up here meaning that the elements are very, very, very close to being a perfect square. So that is very good. If we click on the bar graph of here, we can see which of these elements fall within that category. And then if we move to the next bar and click on that, we can see which of the elements fall within this 96% of being orthogonal. Now, if we go over to the tree over here for our mesh, uh, we can see that our minimum orthogonality is about 75%, which is fairly good. Uh, that is fairly high. And we also can see that the average is 99.7%. So that basically means that the majority of our elements are very orthogonal. So I do not expect there to be any problematic areas that would lead our calculations to diverge in Fluent. I'll go ahead and press on the last bar down here to see which element this is. And we can see that we only have one element in our model with this 75% uh, skewness, uh, you could say. So this is a fairly good result. So again, I don't expect there to be any problematic areas. Now, say if the quality of your mesh isn't that good, there's a few things that you can do in order to get a better quality of mesh. The first one is adjusting your element size. Now, there is not a general rule of thumb. This could be making your element sizes bigger or smaller. It kind of just depends on how the elements uh, fill in the space of your model. And evidently the skewness is being caused by the nozzle wall up here. Because if this was a completely flat rectangle, then all of our elements would be completely orthogonal. It's the 
spline of our nozzle wall that's causing the elements to be somewhat skewed because they're trying to fill in the space that the other orthogonal elements are not filling up. So if changing the element size does not give you a better quality of mesh, you could always go back into your geometry and adjust the spline of the nozzle wall in order to get better uniformity in the convergence and divergence part of the nozzle. The more uniform the converging and diverging part of your nozzle are, the easier it's going to be for your mesher to create orthogonal elements along the nozzle wall. So that is all good to go. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to some name selections. And you may ask, what is a name selection? So name selections are useful uh, going ahead in Fluent because it, because it allows us to more easily place our boundary conditions in Fluent. So an example of a name selection, we're going to have the inlet and the outlet. We're going to have the wall, the center line, and the overall fluid flow. So that when we are influent and we want to apply the boundary conditions to the inlet, we can select inlet and the program is going to know where that is. So in order to create these na name selections, I'm going to go ahead and choose the edge selector tool up here. And we're going to start by creating it for the inlet. So I'm going to right click, or sorry, left click on the edge here and then right click and then press on create name selection and I'm going to name this the inlet. Press OK. And then I'm going to move on to the outlet edge over here. Create name selection. Call this outlet. And then I'm going to move on to the center line. I'm going to name this symmetry because it will allow uh, Fluent to understand that we are going to be mirroring our results and it's going, the results are going to be symmetrical over this center line. And then I'm going to name this, oh, I didn't select the line. I'm going to name this the wall. And then the last name selection we're going to do, I'm going to grab the face selector tool up here. I'm going to grab the face of our fluid and create a name selection for the fluid flow. Press OK. And then if we go over to our project tree over here and press on the plus beside name selections, we can see all the name selections that we've created. And it's always good to double check to make sure that they're in the right place. So we have our inlet, we have our outlet, we have our symmetry line, we have the wall, and we have the overall fluid flow. So that's all good to go. So now with our mesh created and our name selections in place, we can go ahead and move on to Fluent in order to initialize the boundary conditions and actually run our model. So I'm gonna exit the mesher by clicking on the big X at the top. And as you can see, beside mesh, we still have a lightning bolt. And this is because not all of the information that we've created in the mesher was sent to the setup of the program, but that's okay. What we can go ahead and do is right click on mesh and press on update. And it will take a second to update. But once it has, you'll get a check mark beside the mesher and you'll have these green arrows beside the setup, meaning that you can now enter the setup and initialize your model. So now we can double click on setup to launch the Fluent Launcher. And we are met with the Fluent Launcher here. For the simulation, I'm gonna want double precision. So make sure to click that checkbox. And for my specific machine, I know that I can uh, up the solver processes to two and the GPGPUs per machine to one. Now these are pretty generic uh, settings for any computer, but just if you need to verify this, just go into your hardware settings on your computer. So with all that being said, I can go ahead and launch the Fluent Launcher by pressing on the start and Fluent will now launch. Now with Fluent open, we can go ahead and start initializing our model with the boundary conditions. So first we're gonna specify uh, various informations about our model that we want. We're going to add the materials that we want and we're going to change the boundary conditions in order to get supersonic flow at the outlet of our nozzle. So if you've seen part one where we did the subsonic flow throughout the nozzle, it's going to be these boundary conditions here where we're going to change the flow or the exit pressure in order to get supersonic flow versus subsonic. So stay tuned for that. But first, we're going to go ahead and specify 
other information because we haven't done this for this particular model yet. The first thing that we're going to do is press on the check here where the mesh is. And this is a very good double check the do just to double check the, the mesh to ensure we're not going to run into any errors. And the inf it's going to print various information to the console window down here. What we're interested in is the volume statistics. We want to make sure that all these numbers are positive because you can't have a negative volume or you can't calculate things with a negative volume. It doesn't exist in the real world. So we want to make sure that all of our volumes are positive. That is good to go. So we'll go ahead and move on to the other things now. The type of solver that we want to use is a density-based solver because we are working with compressible flow. And we're going to leave the 2D space to planar because as we saw at the beginning of this video, we assumed our cross-sectional area to be a square slash rectangle, which would give us a rectangular duct for our nozzle. And so as a result, we have determined what our exit pressure is going to be to give us supersonic flow for a 2D planar space. Now you could choose axisymmetric as well, that is all right, but make sure that if you are going to do that, that you've properly calculated what your exit pressure is going to be based on the circular cross-sectional areas that give you your area ratio, because this will give you a different result than taking it as a planar or rectangular cross-sectional area. So just keep that in mind. So now we're gonna move on to the model. So we'll double click on models. Multi-phase flow is off, that is good because we only have one gas in our model. For energy equations, we want these on in order to add the, this part of the equation to our Navier-Stokes equation, which are being used in the calculation of this model. So if we double click on energy, we're gonna press on the check box here to add the energy equation to Navier-Stokes. So press okay. And then for viscous, we're gonna double click on viscous and it's going to open up this window here, and we're going to want to choose inviscid flow for our model. So choose inviscid and press OK. And the rest of the models are going to be left the same. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to the initialization of our material for our model. So if we double click on material, we can see that by default ANSYS has initialized air as the default material being used for fluids. And that is good because that's the material that we want to use, but we do have to initialize it differently. So if we double click on air, we will see that by default, ANSYS has air with a constant density. Now we know that the, the density of the air inside our converging diverging nozzle is going to be variable because we're working with compressible flow. So instead of having a constant density, we're gonna go ahead and choose ideal gas instead. And then we're gonna press on the change create sign in order to confirm this change. Now say if you did want to use a different material that was not air, you could do that as well. You could go ahead and jump into the Fluent database here. And then this is going to open the materials library in Fluent, and you can go ahead and choose any material you wanted. Say if you wanted to choose acetone, you could press on acetone, and that would open this window up here where it lists all the properties that we have. And if you wanted to change any of these properties, because if you wanted a specific fluid in your nozzle that had specific properties, you could always go ahead and change these values down here not a problem. And then to add this material to your project tree, you would go ahead and press on copy. And as you can see behind this, if we now close this window and we'll close this one as well, we can see that acetone has been added to our material tree for fluids. Now, just because we added the material to the material tree does not mean that it's been initialized as the material that we're using in our model. In order to do that, if we double click on cell zone conditions, and if we double click on the fluid flow here, we can see that fluid flow, which was the surface, our name selection of our surface, we can see that the material that we're using is air which is what we wanted. But if you wanted to use acetone or any other material that you added to your material tree, if you press on the triangle for the drop-down menu, 
you could see that acetone has been added to the tree here. So now if we click on acetone and click apply down here, it would initialize our fluid flow to be acetone instead of air. But again, for the simulation, we're gonna use air instead. So we're going to choose air and we're going to press apply. And then we can close this window. So air has now been initialized as our fluid flow. Now we can move on to the boundary conditions for our converging diverging nozzle. So if we double click on boundary conditions, we can see here our named selections. We can see that we have our inlet, our fluid flow, our outlet, our symmetry, and our wall. So if we click on inlet, we can see here that we have a, the type is a velocity inlet, but that is not good because we are specifying our inlet conditions as a function of pressure and temperature. So we want this to be a pressure inlet instead. So we will choose pressure inlet. And that will open this window up here so we can now apply our boundary conditions. So our supersonic initial gauge pressure, this will be our static pressure at the inlet of our nozzle, which we chose to be 225,000 Pascals. And then our total gauge pressure, this is the total pressure or the true pressure all along our nozzle, a function of the static and dynamic pressures. And this was calculated through pressure and area ratios. And this was found to be 266,904 Pascals, the calculation of which I showed at the beginning of this video. We also have our thermal condition, and I chose this value to be 20 degrees Celsius or 293 Kelvin. So that is all the boundary conditions for our inlet of our nozzle. So we can go ahead and apply these conditions by pressing on apply, and then we can close the window. Next, we're going to initialize the outlet conditions in order to get the supersonic flow. So if we double click on outlet, or if we click on outlet, we can see that it's a pressure outlet. That is good because we're going to be specifying the pressure at the outlet of the nozzle. If we double click on outlet, it'll open up the window here. The gauge pressure, this is the exit pressure that we calculated at the beginning of this video in order to get supersonic flow at the outlet of our nozzle. And we found this value based on my other values to be 300, or sorry, 39,000. 768.7 Pascals. Next, we're going to apply the thermal conditions. So if, as we can see here, we have the thermal conditions. And through the area and temperature ratios, this value was found to be 178.43 Kelvin. So if we go ahead and press apply to these conditions, and we can close the window. Next, we're going to check what our symmetry and wall are initialized as. So if we press on symmetry, we can see that the type is symmetry. And if we press on wall, we can see the type is wall. So that is all good to go. Next, we're gonna move on to the solution part of our model. So if we press on methods, there is nothing to change here. By default, these are the solution methods that we want. The two most notable are on implicit formulation and for flow, we want it to be second order upwind. So that is good. Next, we're gonna move on to our monitors. So if we press on monitors and then press on residuals, we can see for a convergence, we're looking to find a 0.001 as our convergence criteria. Now this is a pretty standard convergence criteria but since this simulation does not take up a lot of computational power, we'll be able to run it for more iterations. So I believe it's possible to get a convergence that is closer to one E to the negative six instead. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this to all the categories. And this is just gonna set the standard of how well our model is going to converge. So now that I've changed the convergence criteria to be more accurate, I'm gonna go ahead and press on okay to confirm that change. Now we're going to move on to the initialization part, and this is pretty simple. 
we're just going to use a hybrid initialization. So press on hybrid initialization and then press initialize. And as you can see down to the console window, it says hybrid initialization is done. So that is good to go. So now we can actually run our simulation. So if we go to run calculation, the one thing that we need to specify is the number of iterations for our model. Now, since we are going for a more strict convergence criteria, meaning that the result for convergence needs to be a lot more accurate, we're going to have to run the simulation for more iterations. So I'm going to go ahead and initialize this to be uh, 4,500 iterations, and this should give a fairly uh, good convergence result. If you were to go with uh, a lower convergence result, say uh, the one that we had before there of 0 0.001, uh, you would be able to get away with running it for less iterations. But then again, your standard for your result is going to be slightly less accurate. So with all that being said, we can now go ahead and run the calculations for our supersonic converging diverging nozzle. So I'm going to go ahead and press on calculate. And as you can see down in the console window, it's starting to print a whole bunch of information to the console window. And it shows how many iterations we have remaining to complete in our model. And we also have a progress bar to see how close we are to being completed in the calculation of our model. So this is gonna go ahead and take a little bit of time. So I'll cut back to you guys when the calculations are finished. Hey guys, welcome back. As you can see on the screen, the calculations are now complete. So we can go ahead and start looking at the results for this model. The first thing to note is as you can see in the console window, you can see that the solution converged after only 868 iterations. So that is a very good result. We did not nearly need as many iterations as we thought we would have, and we didn't need as many iterations that we did for the subsonic flow. So I'll go ahead and press on OK for the message here. So first things first, let's take a look at our contours for the Mach number, static pressure, and temperature. So in order to do this, I'm going to press on the plus beside graphics down here on results, and I'm going to right click on contours and press on new. And the first one that we're going to start with is the Mach number. So we can rename this one to Mach number. The contour is going to be a contour of velocity since Mach number is a velocity ratio. And then we're going to ch choose Mach number here. And then we can click on save and display to print it to our viewing window here. And now we can close this menu here, and we are going to mirror this result over the line of symmetry in order to see the full nozzle. So to do this, press on view, and then in display category, press on views, and then select the mirror planes as symmetry, and press apply. So now we can see our whole nozzle in the viewing window here. And as we can see in the viewing window here for our nozzle, we do in fact have supersonic flow at the exit of our nozzle. Now this is an expected result. Since we did calculate the exit pressure to be 39,768.7 Pascals. So as we can see by the color legend here, at the beginning part of our nozzle, our flow starts at a Mach number of approximately 0.4. And through the converging part of the nozzle, we have an increase in velocity, which is going to result in the decrease in pressure that we saw for the subsonic flow. However, denoted by this kind of light blue color here at the throat of our nozzle, we can see that the gas was actually able to reach a Mach number of one or, and or sonic flow, meaning that when it continued through the diverging part of the nozzle, it continued to accelerate into supersonic flow, reaching a Mach number of approximately 2.25 at the outlet of our nozzle. So that is very good. If we wanted to look at this graphically instead, we can go ahead and press on the plus beside plots and right click on XY plot and press on new. And we're going to do a similar thing like we did for the contours. We're going to name this the mock number.
And on the Y axis, we are going to choose velocity, Mach number. And in the X axis function, we're going to choose a direction vector because we want to see what the Mach number is going to be along the length of our center line of the nozzle. And we are going to choose the symmetry line as the surface. So press on save and plot. As you can see down in my console window, it says there's an object with the same name that has already been created. And that's because I have a contour with the exact same name. So instead of naming it mock number, I'm going to name it mock number plot instead in order to differentiate the two. So save and plot. And as you can see, we have plotted our Mach number as a function of the position along the center line of our nozzle. And we can see that it started at a subsonic flow here of 0.4 and continued to accelerate through the converging and diverging part of the nozzle until about 2.25 Mach number. We do see that there's a drop off here at the very, very end of the nozzle where the Mach number shoots back down to subsonic. If we go back to our contour in order to get a better view of what this could actually be, save and display, we can see that there is a change in Mach number right at the outlet of our nozzle. And so this does show that there has been a little bit of error between the 1D calculations that we did and the calculations that were run through ANSYS. But overall, this is a fairly good result. If you wanted to get rid of the shock wave here, you could go ahead and lower the exit pressure very slightly, say to 39,750. And just that decrease in about 18 Pascals uh, should get rid of the start of the little shock wave that we have at the exit of our nozzle here. We could also go ahead and create the contours for our static pressure and temperature. So if I right click on contours and press on new, I can make one for the pressure and it's going to be a contour of pressure. And we're going to choose static pressure, save and display. And now on screen in our viewing window, we have the static pressure all along through our nozzle. If we wanted to show this graphically, we could do that as well. If we right click on XY plot and press on new and make this the pressure plot, remember that the plots and the contours have to have different names. And we choose symmetry as our surface here. Save and display. We can see the graph now represents the bottom portion of the graph that we had at the beginning of the video. We have a high pressure at the beginning here. And as the fluid moves along through the nozzle, the pressure continues to decrease. And since it reached Mach 1 at the center of our nozzle, the flow is going to continue to accelerate supersonically through the diverging part of the nozzle and we will continue to have the decrease in pressure until the exit. And this is unlike the subsonic flow that we had in the previous video where the pressure started to decrease through the converging part of the nozzle as the velocity increased. But since we did not reach Mach 1 at the throat of the nozzle, the pressure went back to increasing with the decrease in velocity. So these are fairly good results. If we wanted to plot our temperature, we could do that as well. Right click, same story, name this temperature, and then make this a contour of temperature and static temperature. Save and display. This is the temperature in our nozzle. And if we close the contour, we can also make the plot for the static temperature. And that's the static temperature plot for the temperature of the fluid inside our nozzle. And if you want to copy any of these graphs outside of Fluent, you can do that as well. Just press on the X here because we don't need that anymore. And if you click on the button here, this is a copy to clipboard and it will copy the active screen here to your clipboard. And you could paste that in a report that you needed to write. In order to change the visible screen here, 
just click on the or double click on the contour or plot that you want and click on the display here and it will then display this contour or plot whatever one you chose and there you have it that is how to set up the converging diverging nozzle in ANSYS Fluent specifically for a supersonic flow condition where we have supersonic flow at the exit of our nozzle. And stay tuned for the next video where we are going to rerun the simulation in order to get a normal shock wave in the middle part of the diverging part of the nozzle here. But that is it for this video. Don't forget to like the video if you guys thought it was helpful and subscribe for more engineering content.